Hi, this is Pastor Curtis Smith at Trinity Metropolitan Community Church. Christ love in the heart of the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex. We are here in Grand Prairie, Texas, and we hope that you look forward to joining us. We'll be sharing scripture and sermon in a moment, and uh, look afterwards for opportunities to join us in ministry, uh, to like us on Facebook, and all those kind of things. We look forward to seeing you here, and uh, I hope that you get something out of this message today. God bless you. God be with you. A reading from the Holy Scripture, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 4, verses 14 through 21. Let us give glory to God. Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee, and his reputation spread through the region. He was teaching in the Galilean synagogues, and all were loud in their praise. Jesus came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, entering the synagogue on the Sabbath, as was his habit. Jesus stood up to do the reading. When the book of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him, he unrolled the scroll and found the passage where it was written, The Spirit of our God is upon me, because the Most High has anointed me to bring good news to those who are poor. God has sent me to proclaim liberty to those who are held captive, recovery of sight to those who are blind, and release to those in prison, to proclaim the year of our God's favor. Rolling up the scroll, Jesus gave it back to the attendant and sat down. The eyes of all of the synagogue were fixed upon him. Then he said to them, Today, in your hearing, this scripture passage is fulfilled. This is the Holy Scripture. Praise you, Lord Jesus Christ. You may be seated. Earlier this week, I was in one of those moods. You know, you get in some of those moods sometimes where you want to just throw a book at someone's face. You ever feel like that? And then you want to yell at them, I just Facebooked you. No, I'm, I'm just kidding. I'm, I'm a mild-mannered pastor. I don't do those kind of things. <laughs> <laughs> Our gospel reading finds Jesus filled with the Holy Spirit and is led to church, the synagogue at the time. Now earlier in the chapter, chapter 4, Jesus is led by the Spirit into the wilderness where he fasts for 40 days and is tempted by Satan. And then when Satan leaves him, the angels of God finally come to attend to him. This is his spiritual trial and then later triumph. Now, I think this is relevant to us as we look to those because we know that Christ faced many of the same trials you face. The trials that you are facing. The times that you feel attacked by the evil one. And also, your times of spiritual eve eleva elevation and those mountaintop experiences that you have. Do you ever notice that sometimes, during your greatest spiritual losses, or maybe even your greatest spiritual highs, are often followed by the evil one looking for ways to get you down. Some of you are, yeah. Where do you go? Well, Jesus went to church. Now, that doesn't solve everything. Next week, you'll have to tune in again to our sermon next week and see the same channel, if you will, of what happens to Jesus and how the crowd went from loudly singing his praise to trying to stone him death later. Oops, I... That's kind of a spoiler alert. I didn't mean to do that. <laughs> but read chapter 4, Luke, and, and I promise you we'll see that next week too. So Jesus went from a very taxing spiritual trial to this mountaintop experience. And then where does he go? He goes to church. The Iglesias at the time. The gathering of the people. It's not the building. We've known that for a long time as a church, Trinity MCC. We've known that from the time that uh, Trinity MCC had a building that they couldn't afford and, and had to sell. Or when we rented a tiny space that only had one bathroom. Or when we came here and then there was a fire and we had to go out and meet other places until we could find, get it resettled and get the insurance taken care of and be back in this space. We know that the church is not the building. It's the people. It's the people of God. And so that's where Jesus gathered, with that gathering group. Not where your name is on the roll, or the place where you're baptized but rarely show up to. And certainly not the place you send your money to, to make God happy. Or the channel that you tune into to 
at your leisure or not. No, the church was the gathering of the people on any given Sabbath. And in this case, as we're talking, any given Sunday. I read a story uh, about Pastor Thomas Long. He had, he's been in many different churches, and he's kind of a well-known speaker. And he said, many years ago, when I was a brand new pastor of a small church, I announced to my congregation one Sunday, next Sunday morning at 10 o'clock, I'm going to start a pastor's church school class on the basics of Christian faith. And if you're new to the faith, or if you would like a refresher course in the faith, I invite you to join me this next Sunday at 10. He said that the next week he went into the classroom and expected to be greeted by a throng of people, but it was immediately disappointed. There were only three elementary school aged children, three little girls, waiting for him in the class. He tried to hide his disappointment over the next few weeks as he did his best to teach these little girls about Christian faith. And it was a week before Pentecost Sunday when he said to them, Do you girls know what Pentecost Sunday is? Obviously they didn't. So he said, Well, Pentecost was when the church was seated in a circle and tongues of fire came down from heaven and landed on their heads and they spoke the gospel in all kinds of languages from all over the world. Now two of the little girls took this rather calmly. But one got her eyes as big as saucers. And when she could finally speak, she said, Reverend Long, we must have been absent that Sunday. <laughs> now granted, it's not Pentecost Sunday every Sunday. But the same Holy Spirit, the same brothers and sisters in Christ are here. The same miraculous love and works of God are revealed in our love for each other. The living word of God that does not come back void is still read aloud. The love and life of Jesus is still testified about in our songs and in our prayers and in our sermons. The breaking of bread together in our communion time, just as we were commanded to, to remember Christ. And if you're not here, you might be missing something. My sermon title came from the movie Any Given Sunday. You might remember that 1999 Oliver Stone movie about an aging quarterback, Dennis Quaid, and, and Al Pacino as the coach. And they had been a winning team, and now they were kind of on a big losing streak. And I guess it's kind of important now when the Cowboys didn't make it to the playoff, finish the playoffs and get into the Super Bowl. But anyway, it's important to us, right? Even anyway, Cameron Diaz is the team owner's daughter, and she inherits the team. And Jamie Foxx is a rogue star in the group. And, and also the LL Cool J is in it, and he's one of the flashier teammates. There's even Charleston Heston and Ann Margaret. I mean, there's lots of famous people in this movie. But Al Pacino, as coach Tony D'Amato, says, this game has got to be more than just winning. You're part of something here. Along the way, I want you to cherish it. Because when it's gone, it's gone forever. Do you see this community of faith this church, this gathering of people, something that you should cherish? Something that you would feel a loss if it went away? I think so. In the movie, Al Pacino, as the coach, describes the game of football as a game of inches. You're an inch from catching the ball, an inch from getting that touchdown, an inch inside the sideline. But think about the inches and the incremental times in our church, and any church for that matter. Not just the major holidays, the Christmases, the Easter, those kind of things, but on any given Sunday. At the beginning of chapter 5 in the book of Ecclesiastes, it's written that we are told that we should guard our steps as we go into the house of God and listen instead of offering the sacrifice of fools who don't even know that they're even being foolish. It says in Ecclesiastes 5.1, it says, As you enter the house of God, keep your ears open and your mouth shut. See, I've been telling you for a long time. No, I mean, but it is evil to make mindless offerings to God. Our passage today said that Jesus went into the synagogue. This was his habit. 
his custom, other translations say. The Greek word is eothos, which is the word we get ethos from. It's used to describe that guiding beliefs are, are ideas, the characteristics and how you describe someone. It was his overall characteristic not to miss synagogue. What about you? If someone is looking for you between 11 and noon on any given Sunday, where would they find you? I read an article recently about the four ways to prepare for real worship, and I thought I'd like to share this with you. One of them is the internal preparation of your heart. And they imply that each worshiper carries the responsibility for their own personal preparation of their his or her heart. And if God calls us to worship in spirit and in truth, then we must constantly ask questions about the state of our hearts, the readiness of us, and our spirit Every day, not just on Sunday, but every day. There's also the pre-arrival preparation. We learn from the Jews who believe that the Sabbath begins at sundown the evening before. So our Saturday night and our Sunday morning preparation activities should be for that same effect. Whether it's positive or negative, our readiness for worship is implied in those things. Now I'm not saying you can't go to the bar on Saturday night. Heaven's sake, you might even see me there. But be prepared to get home at a decent hour. Early enough on Saturday so that you can or that you finish your chores on Saturday so that you won't have to use it as an excuse to miss Sunday morning. <laughs> then there's a pre-service preparation. It's that short period of time upon your arrival at church and the beginning of actual worship service. That's a critical time too. It's how we interact with each other that reminds us that we are still part of one body. If you're racing to get here to church and that you're to be on time, you've missed the point. My, my father used to say, on time is already late. <laughs> So come early so you can interact with your brothers and sisters. So you can be asked to help in the worship service in some way. So you can have time to quiet your heart from the rush of trying to get through the door. Intentionally quieting our hearts and our spirits before service begins will enable us to get out all those distractions in our heads. Put them all aside to focus on our corporate and intentional worship of God. And since real worship doesn't start when we enter the worship service, but starts well before we get here, it also should go on after we worship. So the next one is the post-service continuation. Worship should continue as we leave the service. It can happen in our homes, at our schools, throughout our work. It can't be contained in a single location, a single context, a cultural style or artistic expression. You should want to go back and read the scriptures that we used in worship and investigate and look for them more deeply to see if you could really trust your pastor on it or not. To sing and re-sing the songs that we use to elevate ourselves in worship. To continue praying for the prayer requests that we've shared with each other about your sisters and brothers that are looking for God to work in their lives this week. So it doesn't matter how good our worship is when we gather. It's really incomplete if that's all it is. Unless it is good when we scatter. So when we gather as well as scatter. Our post-service worship then leads us to this continuous cycle back to number one of the internal preparation of our hearts. Now last week, <laughs> my sermon was a little longer. I usually try to keep them. I can get a little talkative. That's my spiritual gift. I can't help it. <laughs> Your spiritual gift should be to listen. But no, I'm just not. <laughs> Too bad more of you don't have that. But no, I'm just kidding. I, I was telling one of our congregants of what I was going to be preaching on this week. And I read them this passage that we read earlier. And, and I got to the part where Jesus had read the passage from the prophet Isaiah that he had rolled up the scroll and he sat down and said, Today in your hearing, this scripture passage is fulfilled. And one of your sibling congregants said, Well, there you go. That's why people enjoyed listening to Jesus more than you. 